Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, September 19th, 2022. And today in history, September 19th, 1796, George Washington published his farewell address in the American Daily Advertiser. First, it was published all over the place after that, with the title, The Address of General Washington to the People of the United States, on his declining of the presidency of the United States. He was ready to finally retire. Now, some people talk about this each year or every few years, but definitely not enough. So on this episode, once again, like I do almost every year, I'm going to. It is literally filled to the brim with warnings about political dangers like factions and centralization of power, usurpation of power. But there's also a massive section that goes all the way to the end, pretty much, on peace and foreign policy. But pretty much all of these warnings have been ignored, so I'm going to do my best to at least briefly cover them here today. But first of all, a quick hello and a huge thank you to everyone joining me here today, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. While we allow people another minute or so to get notifications to join us on the mainstream platforms, <laughs> they're not as awesome as one might think. Uh, but I'm going to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Leslie G. Good to see you, Leslie Cheriton in Missouri. Tim Martin in Arizona. Dixie Strong in Bama. Liberty Revolutionary. Morning. Clay Kent. Tom Norman in Ren, Ohio. Welcome. Boom Chakalaga. White bearded new. That's awesome. Morning from Maine in Lepanto. Slim. I love these screen names. Christine Meyer in Colorado. Rob Wood, good to see you. Been a while. Good to see you, Rob. Hope you're doing well. Lisa, Missouri Liberty Report, doing great work out there. Gary Townsend, David LeBeau, Walt Boyer, and everyone else. I know I'm missing a few. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Debbie is also in Maine. Thank you for, for joining me here today. Again, whether you've been here for every episode or this is your first one, we do our best to teach people about the Constitution and Liberty, the founding principles and where they came from, and how to defend the Constitution and Liberty when government refuses to do so, which is constantly. Now, if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm going to be mentioning in this episode, I'm barely going to scratch the surface. So you need to go over to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. That's our show homepage. I publish a blog post for every single episode. We've been doing them for over four years, about one to two hours after the live stream is over. And there you're going to find a notes section for each episode, which includes the stuff that I'm mentioning so you can read and learn more in context on your own time. And then you can also find all the different platforms, Ron. We're both video and audio only podcast edition. We might get booted off one of these one of these days. I'm sure we will. And you're going to want to be able to find out where we are. Again, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Let's get over to Washington's very important, very powerful farewell address, which was almost immediately reprinted. Uh, after it came out in the American Daily Advertiser in newspapers in the country, and later it was in pamphlet form. I've got an image of a, I'm not sure if this is the original one, but I found an image uh, here on the screen, which is pretty cool to share as well. Now, Mad Madison, see, I'm jumping ahead. I've done this before, so my brain is going ahead. Washington wanted to retire after one term. He was going to be done in 1792, and he was ready to go. But Hamilton wanted him to stay. And Jefferson, who specifically was the opposition to Hamilton and didn't like many of Washington's policies, specifically the bank bill, Hamilton's bank bill, which was passed in 1791. Jefferson, in his discussion about that bill, said, hey, this is not authorized to the Constitution to take a single step beyond the limits of the Constitution is to take a boundless field of power. But Jefferson, the opposition here, he also urged Washington to stay. They felt that his leader his name was needed to keep the country from falling into some level of chaos, I guess. Maybe some other time I can do a, an episode covering the Jeffersonian kind of take on that. But anyway, so Washington had asked James Madison to draft him a farewell address back in 1792. Up on the screen, you'll see here, but I will also link to it in the show notes. I'm not covering Madison's draft on this. Uh, Madison drafted that in June of 1792. It's interesting to kind of compare how this goes out. Now, Washington also wanted to point out to people, and this is how he actually, in the beginning part of his farewell address, 
1796. He wants to make it clear, hey, I tried to get out of here, but I was told that my service was needed. I preferred to retire, and retirement is finally coming for me now. And he said the strength of my inclination to do this previous to the last election, he didn't want to do it, had even led to the preparation of an address to declare it to you. But mature reflection on the then perplexed and critical posture of our affairs with foreign nations and the unanimous advice of persons entitled to my confidence impelled me to abandon the idea. So both on the Hamiltonian side and the Jeffersonian side, they compelled him. They urged him to stick around. This is a man of duty. Whether you love him or you hate him, you like his policies, you oppose his policies. I mean, Jefferson himself opposed many of the policies. He resigned from one station, for example. And he thought that some of the stuff that Washington was signing was incredibly dangerous to the future of the Constitution and liberty, but still urged him to stay. They respected his sense of duty and his approach to things still. So he wanted to mention that his desire to uh, to hold on to this was so important. And he had actually held on to Madison's completed draft for eventual publication. And here from the Washington Papers Project in 1796, now determined to retire, the embattled president, he was having some, there weren't, not everybody was uh, loving his policies. Certainly we know that happened as early as 1791, maybe even before that, but not everybody was loving his policies. There were some foreign policy concerns uh, and he wasn't as pop, well, very popular, but a lot of the stuff that was going on was not. So he asked Alexander Hamilton for help in revising Madison's draft. They write, the political climate in 1796 was contentious. Nascent party politics, certainly factions were a problem, and we'll get into Washington's warnings on factions here in a moment, were made uglier by disagreement over foreign policy, especially as it related to the Jay Treaty with Great Britain. In his address, Washington wanted to communicate the wisdom he had learned from his second term and to emphasize his initial intention to resign at the end of that first term. So his goal was to get out of there. He did his job. It's important to go home. Now, some people during the ratification debates were talking about this. Oh, OK, the people who wanted more of a, a, a monarchy style thing, the Han Hamiltonians, thought that's, that a an elected president, no matter how much power they had. Now, of course, the Hamiltonians wanted to have way more power. They thought that going back to private life was a downgrade. But the people who actually supported the notion of a, a power from the people rather than power to the people, that the people are the source of power, they considered an upgrade. Because if you are only acting as a servant, then you're basically a servant of everybody else. And finally, you get to be at the top of the food chain. And that's a different type of a mentality. Anyway, so I also have here... Uh, an enclosure of the draft of Hamilton's work in July of 1796. I will link to that in the show notes. Now, I want to talk about three main areas where the people for generations have absolutely ignored Washington's warnings. And you have to jump down over some formalities and discussion about the Union. And the, I want to, before getting into factions, which is a big one, he does mention this. And I think this is the foundation that builds upon everything else. Without this as a foundation, no matter what his warnings are, they're going to be ignored. They're going to be a problem. And that's not specifically what he said, but it's almost like, he discarded any, cons let, let me just read this, interwoven as is the love of liberty with every ligament of your hearts, no recommendation of mine is necessary to fortify or confirm the attachment. Now, unfortunately, living under the monster state of today, the largest government in history, we're literally surrounded by people all around us all the time who hate liberty. Even those who agree with us on things, single issues from time to time, they're generally bad on everything. So unless you have people who love liberty and understand it, as Samuel Adams put it some years earlier, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. So you have to love and value freedom and liberty and know how to defend it. Without that, you're in a lot of trouble. So we're missing that, certainly. Washington thought thought things were different at the time. The people of that time certainly had more of an attachment, at least in his mind, to liberty. So let's talk about factions. Factions. He said, this spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed, 
but in those of the popular form, it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. So a popular government, that's how he was describing the republic, the constitution for the United States. He thought that uh, the influence of factions or the desire to be part of a faction was the worst enemy for the people. So really dangerous stuff. He goes on with this. And this is really the money quote that is not only a warning, but a prediction of what was going to happen. And I think he absolutely nailed it. He certainly thought his prediction was going to be way out in the future. Don't really freak out about that. I'll get to it in a moment. But check this out. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. So literally just back and forth, one team back and forth, going after the other, rather than focusing on uh, on principles, focusing primarily on team play only. That in and of itself is a frightful despotism. And the reason is, is because if they care less about the Constitution, if they care less about the, about liberty than just getting the other people through a spirit of revenge, then certainly they'll be willing to throw away principles and expand power in order to do that. And then the other side expands power and expands power and expands power, and eventually you live under the largest government, the largest empire in history. And that's what he was getting to here. He says, but this leads at length to a more formal and permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual. And sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more able or more fortunate than his competitors, turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. Man absolutely nailed it. If we are not in that scenario right now, we are so close, it's almost indistinguishable, the difference. So he did say that he didn't expect this to happen for a long time. And he basically said, you know, without looking forward to a, an extreme situation, an extremity way down the line, he said it was such a dangerous situation, a dangerous potential outcome, it was good to be aware of the potential and prepare against it. In other words, don't have a faction-first mentality, ever. It is always wrong. Start with the Constitution and start with liberty, the Constitution, and focus on following that as your goal. So that's number one, warning on factions. Totally ignored today. Almost everybody takes a party-first approach in almost everything. Or a party, we're going to just want to defeat the other side. You know, we're going to own the libs, we're going to own the conservatives, and that's all they care about. So number two is about consolidation, centralization of power, and the usurpation of power that happens with it. He said, it is important, likewise, that the habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres avoiding in the exercise of the powers of one department to encroach upon another. Man. So basically saying, hey, if you get in office, you better be a good dude, a good person, and don't do stuff you're not authorized to do. Unfortunately, we know that people with power will always try to expand power, but he recognizes that, I think, a little bit as well. He said the spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one and thus to create whatever the form of government, a real despotism. Again, he's talking about, well, it could be way down the line, but he is warning about a potential tyranny, a despotism that can come. And he's talking about this in 1792, 1796, when, oh, okay, maybe they did a few things that shouldn't have happened. Maybe I screwed up a little bit. But this is a really, this is a crucial period, and we have to be smart about this, because as soon as you allow them the precedent to do stuff, then it breaks down and it goes on and on. And that's what Jefferson said. Again, to take a single step beyond the limits of the Constitution is basically to take a boundless field of power, no longer susceptible 
of any definition. I'm paraphrasing that one, probably butchered it, butchered it. But anyways, he's talking about a despotism, whether it's a faction first approach. And the factions, of course, leads to consolidation of power, because if you care less about the limits of power and more about owning the other team, you're going to be OK with expanding power to do that. And then they go back and forth with this spirit of revenge to lead to a real despotism. But he says a just estimate of that love of power and proneness to abuse it, which predominates in the human heart, is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. Again, he recognizes that power is a corrupting influence and human nature, human beings are flawed creatures. I make so many moral, personal mistakes in my own life, and I'm always just trying to be better, but we have to recognize that people with power are the most dangerous. The people who want to go through what it takes to get into power are probably most, most willing to see it expand. And he warns about human nature. You don't hear as much from the Federalist side, if you go back to the ratification debates, about these concerns about human nature. It mostly came from the anti-Federalist side, so this is actually really Interesting to hear from the Washington farewell address. Here's from an article by Mike Meharry, who published probably four years ago something. He said, Washington advised that we should hold tight to the original Constitution and avoid, and I like how he puts this, giving in to the temptation to turn it into a living, breathing document that changes at the whim of whoever holds power. Think about that. An, an arbitrary government is how the founders and the old revolutionaries referred to a government that could change the rules for that government on a whim, based on political reality, power, will, whatever it may be. And an arbitrary government was one of the complaints, one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence, is how the, the founding generation defined tyranny. As Washington put it, Mike writes, we must, quote, resist with care the spirit of innovation upon its principles, however specious the pretext. So don't ever, ever allow them to go beyond the limits of the Constitution. He warns against letting this happen, even if you like the short-term results. Again, this, this kind of faction-first mentality leads people to say, well, I got to get this done now. And you only think about how it's going to impact you today if you support government doing something, centralization of power, consolidation, forcing all the people to do things the way you like it without thinking about how, and I'm not, don't mean you personally. Well, maybe, I don't know. I've probably done this many times in the past. Oh, this sounds great right now, but without thinking of the long-term impact because every power that you give them to do something you like today will eventually be in the hands of someone who probably hates you in the future. And he says, do not allow them to take extra power, even if you like the results. And he's basically just saying, look, if there's a process to change the limits of power, if you want them to do additional stuff or change things, he says, if in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitution, constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment in the way the Constitution delegates. If you don't like the limits on the federal government, change it. There's a process there for it. If you can't get enough support for it, then it's not ready to happen. He says, but let there be no change by usurpation. For though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. Again, usurpation is an exercise of power it's a theft of sovereign power from theft of power from the sovereign people of the several states. St. George Tucker in 1803, in his view of the Constitution of the United States, referred to usurpation as an act of treason against the sovereignty, the final authority of the people. So it's really, really bad stuff. And Washington recognizes, and maybe he's even thinking, did I do this? I sure, certainly tried not to, or maybe this is kind of a mea culpa. At the end, I think it it might be a little bit of both here, or maybe I made mistakes. Maybe I took on too much power. I certainly tried to not to, and I'm not really sure of the mental state on this as well. But he's recognizing that as soon as you allow them to take on additional power for stuff that you like today, it is also a weapon in the future. So Think of government power always as a weapon, a very dangerous tool. He says the precedent must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. 
That's basically the same kind of message that he put in his circular to the states, maybe the beginning of his first farewell back in 1783. This is in June 8th, 1783. He said, at this auspicious period, the United States came into existence as a nation. And if their citizens should not be completely free and happy, the fault will be entirely their own. It is up to the people to keep things in check. And if you allow the government to do stuff you like for short-term results, he put it in 1796, you're not going to be free because that's a weapon how they destroy freedom. So one is faction, faction first mentality. Two, usurpation of power and consolidation. They all really tie together. Maybe that's three. I don't know. However you want to count it, it doesn't matter. But the third one is peace. And it's a 6,000 word essay that he wrote here. Almost a third of it is dedicated to peace and foreign policy. Unfortunately, this part is definitely always ignored. And there's so many ways that he talks about this. How does he start his message about peace? He starts it with the national debt. He says, as a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible, avoiding occasions of expense by cultivating peace. A huge debt makes your country weak. So treat, be smart about how you spend money. Don't do all kinds of deficit, deficit spending. And on top of it, cultivate peace with everyone. Because the more peace you have, the less debt you have, the less debt you have, the more peace you have. And the more of all of that you have, the more liberty everybody has. He doesn't, I don't think he really got into that detail, but certainly. He says, but also remember that timely disbursements to prepare for danger frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it. So he's also saying peace through strength. He's not saying let's just be weak and wait to be attacked. He's also he's saying let's not overspend. Let's be smart about how we spend. Let's also so, show that we're strong so that we can repel people who might attack us. So it's a very, very kind of it's got a little bit of all of it, I think. He said, avoid likewise the accumulation of debt, not only by shunning occasions of expense, which never they don't ever shun them these days, but by vigorous exertion in time of peace to discharge the debts which unavoidable wars may have occasioned, not ungenerously throwing upon posterity the burden which we ourselves ought to bear. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson at one point said, you know, spending on stuff today and leaving it for another generation is swindling futurity on a grand scale or a large scale. And that's a very similar message that George Washington has here. Don't just run into debt. It makes the country weak. And then people in the future are screwed by your action. So that's, well, anyways, going on. He says with this, continuing with peace, observe good faith and justice towards all nations, cultivate peace and harmony with all. This is a mentality that he had. This is General Washington here. He signed this as General Washington. He's a hero of the revolution. And people, whether you think he was an awesome general or not, the people absolutely were in awe of him as being a, a revolutionary war hero. And this should have a lot of impact. When General Washington says, peace and harmony with all, we should really take a pause and listen to that over and over and over. And he says, in the execution of such a plan, nothing is more essential than that permanent, inveterate antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachment for others should be excluded. Do not have permanent hatred or permanent alliances with anybody. Don't have love or hatred for any nation. You just have to observe good faith and justice and peace with everyone at every chance possible. He says, in place of them, just and amicable feelings towards all should be cultivated. Mind your own business. He said, the nation which indulges towards another a habitual hatred or habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. So you're basically a slave 
to how that other nation acts. It is a slave to its animosity or its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. We see this happen all the time in modern times. Constitution be damned. As long as we actually fulfill this permanent agreement or permanent opposition to some country or some group or another, everything else has to be thrown out the window. He says, antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury, to lay hold of slight causes of umbrage, and to be haughty and intractable when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur. So it leads to war, and that's what he says. The nation prompted by ill will and resentment sometimes impels it to war the government. The peace often the peace often, sometimes perhaps the liberty of nations, has been the victim. It's the same situation with a permanent attachment. So don't have permanent hatred or antipathy towards any particular country because people are people and governments are governments. So maybe if you don't like a government, that's one thing. But don't make it permanent. Look at the situation. He says, so likewise, a passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Man, that's... The United States has definitely, definitely gone the opposite direction of this mentality. Permanent attachment and permanent opposition, it seems like, for our entire lives. Sympathy for the favorite, favorite nation, he says, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists. How many times that have we heard that the United States has to have the largest military on the face of the earth, eight times larger than uh, or larger than the next eight, nine countries combined, because we have to protect American interests, but they're really, really talking about other countries' interests giving money to dictators and things like that, overthrowing countries back and forth and back and forth, taking one side and then another. And that's what he's talking about. There's an imaginary common interest. Rather than focusing on what's going on here, how are we being more free and being a beacon of liberty to the world? He said we get this imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists and infusing into one the enmities of the other. It betrays the former into a participation in the quarrels and wars of the latter without adequate inducement or justification. So, of course, we know this happens all the time. And it is very similar to the mentality, the problem with factions. So it's fascinating. I'm not sure if he was even thinking this, but as I read through this every year, and I read it at least once a year, it's the idea of attachment to one nation or against one nation is the same problem that you get out of it as attachment to one team or another. He says excessive partiality for one foreign nation and excessive dislike of another cause those whom they actuate to see the danger only on one side and serve to veil and even second the arts of influence on the other. We see the same thing in party politics. The problem is only the other team. It's never our guys. Our guys are always okay. Or if our guys do something similar, there's an excuse for it. The same thing goes with foreign policy. He said real patriots, real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. And of course, the great conduct. How should we conduct foreign policy? And this is the general guiding principle for General Washington. He said the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little, little political connection as possible. This is a foreign policy of peace and free trade, commerce, because that's how you advance things in a better way. He said it is a true policy. It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world. So, you know, I actually think Washington signed on to a few expansions of federal power that were unconstitutional. Primarily, the big one is the National Bank Bill, the, establishing that bank in 1791 with Jefferson, uh, James Madison, Edmund Randolph. They were all opposed to, but Hamilton loved this. This was a big part of his mercantilist, big government foreign policy. But it's possible that Washington thought that this was okay. It's possible that this is kind of a mea culpa. This closing section, I thought, really struck me again as I was reading it last night. He said, though, in reviewing the incidents of my administration, I am unconscious 
of intentional error. I think he's acknowledging, okay, I may have screwed up, but it certainly wasn't on purpose. And it's almost, he's almost apologizing here. He says, I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I may have committed many errors. Who knows which ones they were? He may be thinking of something specific. He's not saying that. But he's what he's trying to tell the people is, hey, I tried my best. I probably screwed up a lot. I'm a human being. I'm sorry. He said, I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to view them with indulgence. And that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion, as myself must soon be to the mansions of rest. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You don't hear any modern politicians basically say, hey, I am really kind of incompetent. I did my best. I tried to do my duty, but I'm certain I made a bunch of mistakes. No, these are all psychopaths today. All of them. They're all psychopaths. They love power and control. Anyways, here's how Mike Meharry wraps up the whole thing. He said, sadly, Washington's advice has not been followed. That should be pretty obvious. Virtually every change to America's constitutional system has been by usurpation. The bastardized federal government has run up trillions upon trillions in debt. It fights unconstitutional wars across the globe. It spies on virtually everybody and violates the right to keep and bear arms. It tells you what kind of insurance to buy and what kind of plants you can grow in your backyard. When did he write this one? This is pretty good. He says it reaches into every corner of your life, attacking your liberty at every turn. This is the largest government in history. And Mike says Washington was right. Whatever transient benefit the federal government may have brought by these actions has been overbalanced by evil. And I think this is a really important message. And I do an episode, I think it's been probably four years in a row that I've done an episode covering uh, Washington's farewell address. I try to give it a little bit of different take each year. And maybe we can look back at them at some point and see where I've screwed up myself. But nothing helps us get this kind of message out to more people, these foundational principles, more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us today for as little as two bucks a month. We take that dirty government fiat and we put it to good use, taking a stand for the Constitution and liberty and teaching people what they need to do, whether the government wants to follow the Constitution or not. And it absolutely doesn't. It almost never does. Again, 10thAmendmentCenter.com slash members is where you can join us today. And I do want to take a quick moment and say a huge, huge thank you to just a handful of people who've given us some of their financial faith and support recently by joining us as members. There's Tina in Texas, Curtis in Illinois, Clinton in Alaska. Awesome. David in North Carolina, Susan in, oh man, I put the wrong initials. I don't know if it's California, Southern California. South Carolina. Susan, thank you. There was also James Owens gave us a super chat over on YouTube last week. I want I missed that. I like to get those when they happen. So I want to say thank you to everyone there. I really hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I'm going to have to take a look in the chat a little bit later today and tomorrow and see if there's any feedback that I can respond to. You can also email me at team at 10th Amendment Center com if you've got questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes. I read through all of them. I get a very little time to reply to many, but I appreciate the feedback and the comments on those mainstream platforms like or uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts. That will help trigger those platforms, algorithms, and help show us to more people. It helps out a great deal. Again, I really appreciate you being here. Don't forget 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. If you got a couple of bucks you want to throw our way, we'd really be grateful for any support you can consider giving us today. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I appreciate you being here. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope your Monday's off to a good start. And I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.